subscribing and leaving comments.
some wild suppositions and distortions of what had actually happened with this whole ice man thing. Uh, Richard, once again, after a, a long evening of pouring over Hans of Bones and letting him play in the files a little bit, uh, tried to encourage me to do a paper or give a paper at this particular symposium. And uh, eventually, I think the lateness of the hour took away my good reason, and here I am today. <coughs> The whole Iceman scenario for myself started in 1967, in August, at the Wisconsin State Fair. I have always been, as I told you before, a lover of curiosities. Uh, I've learned a lot over the years from curiosities. Anomalies certainly do have their place, but let's not make them paramount to other forms of good, solid science. And uh, lo and behold, as I enter the State Fairgrounds, I'm trying to stretch this out by the way, I'm out of time again. As I enter the state fairgrounds, <clears throat> went off to the left, and here's a brand new exhibit. Probably the most beautiful exhibit I had ever seen in my life at a state fair. And it's this gigantic blue tractor trailer truck with chrome oozing from every pore. Caveman frozen in ice. Well, I thought. I want to go see this one, see how they put it together and what it is. And uh, then I saw the price, and I was shied off actually for a few hours. It, at that time, it was 50 cents, and there was no attraction on the midway. That was more than a quarter at that point. Good old days. Uh, I came back a few hours later and couldn't resist the temptation, laid down my 50 cents, went in, and there was just a flow of people going through this thing. And the people were far more interested in looking at this trailer than they were at what was sitting in the middle of this little platform on sort of a, a raised coffin-like freezer container. I looked at it. I looked at it as much as I could without getting pushed away by the rest of the people trying to go through. Walked out, uh, and I had Danny, Frank, or Danny Perez, rather, uh, last evening asked me what my first impression was of the thing. I didn't really have a first impression as such. I thought it was interesting. It was fun to look at. And the important thing was, at that time, the ice was clear. And parts of the thing in the ice were actually sticking out. As time went on that day, after looking at the moo cows and lots of other good things at the, at the fair, I decided I want to go back and look at it again because I couldn't make any determination as to how they put it together or what they had done with it. I went and looked at it again, tried to get a little information out of the, uh, out of the owner, but it, it turned out the person I was talking to was not the owner. So I came back the next morning, and that was probably my most significant visit, because I got there when there were very few people, and I went and looked at it again. My curiosity was starting to get the better of me, because I couldn't really determine how this thing was constructed. And I started to look very carefully at it. And this uh, early middle-aged fellow who was fidgeting around came over, and uh, I could feel him hovering because I was taking a long time looking at what I was doing. And it turned out his name was Frank Hatson, and he was the, uh, depending upon what day of the week it was, he was the owner, the representative for the owner, uh, the person who brought it into the country, the person who found it, you name it. But he had no real explanations or answers of any kind, none that were acceptable to me. Uh, he made various wild claims about where this supposed artifact came from, why it was there, and who found it, and so on. And again, those changed minute by minute sometimes, depending upon who he was talking to. I really didn't care much about his explanations once I found out that Mr. Hansen was, in fact, a pathological liar or something darn close to it. I do not profess to be a psychologist. I have encountered enough people in my lifetime, uh, especially in the science field, who can fit that particular description. And the other thing is that Mr. Hansen was a very paranoid individual. I mean, as I got to know more and more about Hansen, he was probably treatably paranoid. He was a very strange guy from that standpoint. Quintessential showman in many ways but with a lot of, shall we say, uh, behavioral aberrations. He was a, he was a very odd duck. Uh, I went in to 
see that exhibit probably another four times that day. Spent, uh, spent my pittance all too often. And if you think he gave me a quantity discount, you don't know Frank Hansen. I looked at it, I would say, seven or eight times when it was at uh, the Wisconsin State Fair, summer of 67. After I was all finished looking at it, I didn't quite know what to think. And I spent an entire year sort of wondering about it in the back of my mind. I had been attending some anthropology classes, although it had nothing to do with my major other than it did count for physical sciences uh, set of credits. So I was getting some pretty good, pretty fresh information about nominative physiology, uh, not to mention what I picked up on my own and from other uh, pre-med type classes. And when I went back again the next summer, 1968, I spent a great deal of time again looking at it. He had by this time started to recoat this thing twice. He recoated it by spraying water over it. Uh, the areas that had originally been exposed were still damaged from the desiccation <clears throat> that occurred. I'm going to take a moment here and tell you what I was looking at. And again, do not in any way interpret this as me legitimizing this as an actual specimen of anything. I'm telling you one thing, one thing only, that is what I saw there. There was an apparent carcass of something, hominid in form, frozen in this block of ice, had damage to it in a number of different areas. Actual length of the animal was around six feet. I never was able to actually measure anything except discrete areas where Hanson wasn't looking or when I was able to get in there and his wife was there. <clears throat> she was very easily distracted, so I would have a friend go up with me. He'd distract her, and uh, it was only by chance when I could actually do that. Hanson hovered around that exhibit like you can't believe. That was his livelihood, and that's one of the things that very few people understood. Uh, the question has been asked of me many, many times, why in the world wouldn't a guy like that, if he was that greedy, want to sell that to science or do this or get a million dollars? He had no guarantee of a penny from anyone. As a matter of fact, he was afraid somebody was going to steal the thing from him. And he was making an enormous amount of money off of this thing. Uh, we just did a little hairline calculating one night and figured out that he was probably making, just off the Wisconsin State Fair alone, he probably cleared $150,000. And he probably paid for that exhibit in a couple of months. You don't want something like that taken away from you. You don't want to sell it to anybody because as far as you're concerned, you sell it for a million dollars, all you've got is a million dollars. You've got this thing, you've got a million dollars or two million dollars a year for as long as it's popular. And then maybe turn it over to some other fool who's willing to buy it from you. Back to the description. Much of what Sanderson and Huelmans did was either distorted or exaggerated, and I'm not blaming them for it. Uh, the ice at that time was very thick and caused a great deal of distortion. It was also very cloudy. And I'll get to that as to why and what happened in a bit. When I saw the animal originally through clear ice, and when the uh, parts were exposed, and then the next summer when there was just a little bit more ice over it, I was able to make out a fair amount of detail on the animal. The hands and feet were somewhat disproportionately large, but not by any means the extent that Huelmans and Sanderson represented in their drawings and sketches. The face, uh, again, when you look at their drawings and sketches, if you took that face and sort of pared away the exaggerations on it, uh, it was fairly close. But what they were seeing was almost like a funhouse mirror, again, because of the effect of the thick ice. At least that's that's my belief on that particular subject, so my belief is what I, what I saw later. Uh, it looked that way to me, too, and it's just, there was a great deal of distortion. Some important things about it. You could see the dentition, at least on the left side. The lip was pulled up in sort of a grimace. Had large, chisel-shaped incisors that were flat, yellowish in color. There was checkering in the enamel. Uh, there was also some material caught in the teeth, which may have been organic and 
by the appearance it looked like it was plant material. Uh, there were cracks and fissures in the flesh itself in a number of areas. I could not see a right eye. Uh, it appeared as though the lids were closed but that the orb itself was missing. The left orb was laying out next to the skull. Optic nerve still partially attached. There was a fair amount of blood seeping into the ice. There were bone fragments by it. And it was just it was about parallel or slightly above the superorbital ridge where it was laying. I couldn't make any determination of the actual color of the eye. Uh, ice crystals had pretty well inundated the structure. Other things remarkable about the face, it did not have a prognathous jawline. The area of the forehead was actually fairly unremarkable. And from what I could see, it did not have a pronounced sagittal crest. There appeared to be damage in the rear of the skull, but I couldn't see at any point in time enough to make a firm determination. There was a fair amount of blood in the ice underneath it. There appeared to be some bone fragments back there, and the skull was sort of distorted in shape as you would try and look down behind it. The ice became too thick at that point to really make any any reasonable determination as to the shape of what was going on back there. As time went on, I snuck a hand lens in a couple of times. I did try to take pictures, by the way. That's another question that's asked very frequently. I did try to take pictures, and God knows Hansen was about ready to kill me at that point. Um, I snuck in a couple of little mini cameras, and no matter what I did, Hansen was just on top of me. Uh, the time or the times when I was able to get a hand, hand lens in for twice, his wife was there, thankfully. I usually just kept the thing in my pocket, and if she was there, I snuck over and did what I could, leaning over this casting like thing. I found a couple of interesting things. The hair all emanated from pores, and there were pores that had no hair. There also appeared to be sebaceous material being squeezed out of some of the pores, either from pressure of the ice or other prior mechanics that I don't pretend to know. But I also found some ectoparasites on it, or what appeared to be ectoparasites. There were lice of uh, one sort or another. Uh, they probably were casts, which are shed skins. I found two of those on it. The animal did have a rather robust structure. Is there anybody here, by the way, who did not see any pictures of it or doesn't know about what the Iceman is? Anyone know? Okay. I'm going to refer you to, what's, Richard help me on this, uh, Kuhlman's book is what? French. Yeah, but at least it's got the pictures. No, it's not the other. It's in Right. But it's in French. I think yeah. it's in French. Okay. For those of you who have not seen any pictures of it, I'm, I'm skipping a lot here, just in deference to not boring you completely to death in time. So, uh, the right arm was broken. There was a, a compound complex fracture of that right arm, and uh, the the bone was fairly apparent. It was coming through the skin about a centimeter. The hands certainly had fingerprints, and that was very easily discernible. Uh, could not tell if there were any rid uh, ridges on the feet at all. The feet were in such a position that I could see the, the front part of the toes, top of the toes, if you want to call that the top as you're lying down, anterior portion. You could see a little bit of the foot here, but the ice was quite thick over the ankle area. Probably thicker than anywhere else when I first saw it. Uh, other remarkable things, the sexual organs were I, I can't say they were similar to anything else I'd seen. They were prominent in form, somewhat reduced from what you'd expect for a male of that size. Uh, it appeared to me and my untrained non-anthropological eye to be an adolescent, whatever it was. And that's purely based on the fact that it, uh, the secondary sexual characteristics to me, at any rate, just didn't seem right for an adult male, or an older adult male. So, 
again, if it's a new species or if it's nothing at all or if it's a fake, none of those things matter anyway. There were nipples on the animals that were apparent. Uh, you could barely see the one on the right, you could clearly see the one on the left, and a patch of skin just beneath the left one uh, was left bare. That was one of the areas that became desiccated. Hansen knew nothing about cryogenics, which was uh, very obvious by the way he tried to preserve the thing. And he was his own worst enemy as far as that was concerned. Whatever the thing was, uh, I am satisfied that at least partially it was constructed of organic material, and you say latex is organic, so let's say animal tissue. It was partially constructed at least of animal tissue. I'll get to why in a few minutes. In 1968, after a few more visits and a lot more looking and a lot more comparing and some discrete measuring when they weren't looking of uh, a few little structures, I became convinced that there was something here, at least some other else other than me, should look at someone who really knew what the hell they were doing or talking about. I contacted a few physician friends of mine at the college I was attending, and nobody wanted any part of it. Answers another question as to why people involved with science weren't coming there by the droves. Most of them were afraid of position, tenure, and a few other things. Uh, I will relate a, a short story to you in a moment regarding some anthropologists who were exactly in the same position. I finally gave up on that, decided to get a dentist friend of mine to come over and look at it. He did, in fact, get a brief look at it. He was nothing more than your average DDS. Said that, yes, the, from what he could see, which was very limited, it was probably a workable mouth. That's all he could tell me. Said what? It was probably a workable mouth. In other words, one structurally that could work if, in fact, it was attached to a, a living animal. I had read Sanderson's book, and I'd read other articles by Sanderson over the years, as I think just about everybody has. Uh, I haven't been living in a closet somewhere. So I decided to give him a try. Called him up and felt that he was a person who had a lot more expertise than I did. And in spite of some of his reputation, uh, I thought he was probably the person to turn this whole thing over to. I called him. At first, he was extremely skeptical, which I give him credit for. Uh, as the conversation went on, he questioned me for about 45 minutes over the phone. And most of the questions I thought were quite to the point and appropriate for what we were looking at. A few of them were a little bit fringy, but it turns out later that I found out Sanderson was a showman himself and knew a lot of tricks of the carny. After having spoken to him for this length of time, he suggested that I try to get some physical anthropologists to examine this thing. I did that. I went to the University of Wisconsin, Milwaukee, where Neil Tappan was residing. Uh, I think you know who Mr. Tappan is, am I not correct about that? Neil Tappan was a pretty sharp anatomist from what I had been led to believe. And I sat in his office and explained this whole thing as unemotionally as I possibly could. And he abjectly refused to come and look at it. And I kept saying, why? You know, here I am, just this dumb student thinking that people are out there seeking for the truth. And was soon to find out anything but the, the sort. Well, as the conversation progressed with Tappan, I found out, in fact, he was afraid of his tenure. His comment to me is, yeah, but what if it's real? I said, well, what do you mean, what if it's real? If it's real, it's an incredible, and I got about that far. He said, if it's real, I'm ruined. And I was out of the office. That was the end of him. He wanted nothing more to do with it, and I, a couple more phone calls were met with a deaf ear. I then got a hold of Dr. Bob Benfer, uh, who is not a physical anthropologist, but a very sharp uh, cultural anthropologist. Benfer, although sympathetic, said that he would not be in a position to even render an opinion on the thing. Uh, he was pretty conservative in terms of that and didn't want to get himself in a, in a bizarre situation. Scratch Bob Benfer. I called Sanderson back, told him what kind of luck I was having. Uh, I had made a couple of other calls to other department members, and they, in fact, had given me the same cold shoulder. So it was off to Sanderson again. Sanderson said, look, call George Agagino. 
I've had you call the University of Minnesota, you would have had me. I've been there as fast as a car could go. <laughs> now, wait a minute. Wait a minute. You may, by that statement, be one of the people I want to throw this lectern at. <clears throat> I wasn't aware of that. But that is all news to me. Okay, you also may be able to answer a question that's been bothering me for years. And we'll get to that in a moment. I called George Agogino down in New Mexico, who, as I understood it from a number of his peers, was a pretty well-respected, if renegade, anthropologist. He listened to everything I had to say, and he said, well, I'll tell you what. He said, you know, Sanderson, whatever he does and whatever he is, if he thinks there's enough merit there, I'd come and see it, but I've got prior commitments. There's no way I can do it. There's just no way. Back to Sanderson again. Talked to him further, and he said, look, since I last talked to you, Bernard Huberman's called me. He is making a trip to the States. It's the first time I'm ever going to meet him. Let me see if we can combine a trip Come and examine the thing. I said, hey, that's great. The whole thing's in your court now. All I ask is keep my name out of it, which he did. And uh, he always kept his word on that particular facet of it. I did not want anything but anonymity. I was going into a medical field, which is conservative enough as it is, without getting lumped into the tabloids. Time went on. They examined it. I called them up. Uh, they had made an appointment with Frank Hansen. It took an awful lot of haranguing for Sanderson to actually get to see the thing, but I'm convinced it was, in fact, his showman-like nature that finally got the best of, of Hansen. Hansen did not want a whole lot of publicity in the papers. Hansen had all the business he could handle. He was making lots of money, and anything that was going to damage that money-making opportunity, he looked at as anathema. Well, he and Humans examined it, the next time I talked to Sanderson, I called him. He was furious. He was absolutely furious. And he went on and on about, did you hear what that damn fool Huberman's went and did? And on and on and on and on and on. He made me aware of the fact that uh, when Hansen was reticent about letting him do particular things with this or not turning it over to science, Huberman's began to threaten the man. Threaten him with legal action, threaten him with police this. And Sanderson had made the mistake of saying, if all else fails, there may be some basis for employing an old law about taking bodies over a state line, at which point Hansen would be forced to prove that it was either not a human being or find out that it was and be punished for it. Now, that's not to say that that law could, be, could have been enacted at the time or enforced or anything else. Hansen being what he was, which is extremely paranoid, flipped, went into hiding, at the time that Sanderson examined it, Huberman's examined it, the ice, as I had stated earlier, was very thick. What had happened was the thing started to decay on it. started to decay pretty badly. The stench had become almost intolerable when the glass was out of place from what Sanderson and Huberman's had told me, and I was to find out later it was correct. So every time he thought he smelled something, he sprayed more water on it. Spraying more, more water on it warmed it up further and he never kept the thing cold enough to stop bacterial action. I mean, it certainly, for those of you who have not had anything to do with cryogenics, bacterial action does not come close to stopping at zero degrees centigrade. You've got to get a lot lower than that. Back to Sanderson. I said he was furious with humans. He was. I said that he had threatened Hansen. Humans had threatened Hansen. That was the end of it as far as Sanderson was concerned because Hansen did go into hiding. He did not exhibit it. There was a real problem with it. Then came the Minnesota State Fair. I decided I'd go up there and see if I could at least see the thing one more time. I went up there and there had been damage to the case. He had cracked the glass. And Hansen was nervous as a cat about the whole thing because the odor was horrendous. People were complaining and he was afraid that the health department was going to close him down and or confiscate the thing, and yet he could not get out of his contract to the state fair people. And I'm sure that gave him three ulcers, knowing Hansen the way I did by that point in time. I looked at it a little bit. Hansen, as soon as he saw me, tried to get me out of the exhibit and cursed me from one end of the midway to the other. 
I got out of the exhibit, I went and called the University of Minnesota. I tried to get someone to come and look at it. I said, look, you know, just somebody, come and take a look at this damn thing. <clears throat> Finally, a young anthropologist whose name I do not have, came and looked at it. I did not go in with him because I didn't want him thrown out. He came back out about 15 minutes later. I said, what did you think? He said, it's wonderful. I said, well, what does wonderful mean? He said, it's, it's wonderful. I said, well, is it real? He kind of shook his head and said, it's one of the best things I've ever seen. I said, well, do you think it's real? Do you think it's something? He just sort of shook his head and walked away from me and never answered another question. And that was the end of it. <laughs> and again, my uh, opinion of the academic community was on a real good downhill slide, you know, like the Ferdinand at the last Winter Olympics. And it wasn't Grover Trans. It certainly was not Grover Trans. <laughs> I think I know who it was. Do you, do you think you know who it was? I'd love to know and I'd love to talk to that person. <laughs> Great, thanks. <laughs> I, I can see this is bearing a lot of fruit here. <laughs> okay. In the near future, I was to find out about Ullman's naming this on the basis of looking at it through cloudy, distorted ice, bad lighting, and not enough room to get around it. I was furious, because to me that was the ultimate in bad science. It really was. I found some of the articles that Sanderson wrote to be as colorful as his usual articles. For those of you who never had a chance to talk to or meet the man, he was an interesting person, capable of some very good science when he wanted to be, but a uh, raving madman at times. You cannot, and this is a point I want to make here, you cannot, because of someone's personality, rule out that they did or did not have something, or they did or did not do something. It just makes it that much more difficult if they are not credible individuals. I got to the point where I totally ignored Hansen because what he had to say or do had zero impact on what I was looking at. I saw the animal, creature, thing frozen in ice, whatever you want to call it, one more time at a shopping center. Except it wasn't it. I went in, I looked at it, this was about nine months later. It was being shown at a shopping center up in the Twin Cities. I was up there visiting a friend of mine. There was a shabbily constructed model laying in the ice, roughly the same position, most of the detail missing, uh, obviously a fake. And to my knowledge, that is what's been in the ice ever since. Questions? Uh, in all of your investigations, No. As I said, Mr. Uh, Mr. Hansen changed the origin as it was convenient for him. I have no idea what the origin is. I have no reason in any way to connect this to the American phenomenon known as the Sasquatch. I can't tell you that it was a real animal. All I can say about the only thing I'll go on record saying is that if it was a fake, it was the most incredible fake I'd ever seen. And I love fakes. I like looking at them. And whoever did that, that's as good a reason to snag a, a thing like that as anything. If, if that was indeed a fake, you could learn how that was done. You'd have some serious technology under your belt. So, Mr. Francis. Uh, yes. Uh, Wiggleman still believes that the Iceman was real, that he had saw. Um, at one point, did Sanderson change his, his feelings on it after they had seen it? He, he published something. Uh, again, I got that second hand. I never read it uh, all the way through. I don't think Sanderson so much has changed his mind as saved his ass, if you'll excuse the expression. Uh, earlier, it sounded like you were going to give a little more detail on why you thought it was a real scan or something. I'm, I'm waiting for questions about the anatomy because I'm not going to sit here and try and do a top to bottom on it. I just gave you a couple of highlights. Yeah, you were talking about skin and lice. Well, if it's got pores and it's got hairs in, in the pores and the, the hairs follow patterns, uh, 
and the, you know there are skin flakes that are visible. I have pretty good reason for suspecting that it is in fact some sort of integument off of some sort of animal. Yes, in your uh, what did you estimate its height to be? Uh, somewhere around six foot, probably under six foot, but somewhere around that. And I, again, I never got a chance to measure the whole thing. I measured fingers uh, a couple of times. I was I was able to measure some other structures when I could sneak a little plastic tape thing on it. In your opinion, and uh, I specify your opinion, do you think it could have possibly been a partially decayed corpse of a chimpanzee? Or something no. Like that? Uh -uh. Okay, that brings up an important point. I'll tell you what it wasn't. It was not a homo sapiens of modern origin. It was not a hypertrichotic human. It was not any known ape, unless it had been doctored just enormously. And I don't know how in the world they would have changed the limb proportions on it. You know, there are a lot of things about it that just were not ape-like at all. So does that, I hope that answers your question. You have an estimated cranial capacity of it. Did it have opposable thumbs, and what was the hair covering the body? OK, yes, it had opposable thumbs. They were not identical to a human's. Uh, I have no idea on the cranial capacity. I mean, I could, as I said, I couldn't see the back of the head. So how could I? Did the forehead seem kind of vertical? Did it drop back? Oh, the, it did not have a particularly pronounced superorbital ridge. And the forehead appeared to be outside the range of human, but not as, as sloped as some other primates. Was the body um, covered with hair? Was it yes, the body the was covered with hair. Uh, the hair had patterns. There were areas where there was no hair on the face. Uh, it had almost a widow's peak effect on the sides here, on the face, which in later incarnations with more ice, you couldn't see any of that detail. The, another interesting thing, Sanderson described it as having a goody hair, and I don't necessarily concur with that. I'm not saying it wasn't, because he knew more about hair than I did at that point in my life, but uh, from everything I remember, that hair wasn't a goody. Uh, two questions. Was there an odor, and did the, did the glass, was it broken before Sanderson and what was there? It was broken while they were there. And one of the layers of glass, it had a double layer of glass over it. One was sealed, one was not. Uh, I don't know which piece was broken when they were there, but they broke one piece with their lights. He broke another piece in an accident, transporting it. Probably he was frantic to get it to the next fair date or what have you. There was a very pronounced dead animal odor, and that's something I smell more than my share of. Yeah. Where is Hanson today? I have no idea. I kept track of them sort of in a... Pardon? Is he traceable? Anybody's traceable if they're still alive. And you want to pay him up. And uh, I, for a while I kept track of them sort of a cursory way. I had some friends who lived in White Bear Lake, Minnesota. And we sort of kept track of his comings and goings for a couple of years. And the whole thing sort of evaporated. I got into my own work, and that was the end of that. Two questions. Were you able to uh, 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 ask Hansen uh, about this apparent change uh, between the original assessment and what was uh, substituted? Was it was, was Danny asked question? me that. Yeah, Danny asked me that last night, and uh, I never, I never asked him about it because it was. I just walked in and I laughed. I, it was exactly what I would have expected him to do, and he said, "Well, what did Hansen say?" And I said, "Well, I, I cannot tell you. My impression." today is that Hansen said something like, see, I told you it was a fake, and laughed, and we both laughed, and that was the end of it. Uh, Follow-up, uh, what was Hansen's reasoning, or did he give reasoning as to why uh, it could not be x-rayed? Why it could not be x-rayed? Well, I almost, in, in the early portions, in 1967, I almost had him convinced to do dental x-rays on it, because with the, the setup the way it was, that was possible. Yeah. Using a little side scan unit, uh, you could have done it especially with a good high-resolution film on it. And on the other side, the ice wouldn't have been that much of a problem at that point. So he, he didn't agree that? Well, Did he give a reason at one point? Oh, his reasons were different every day. It depended upon what mood he was in. But I'll tell you another thing that may answer a couple of other questions. If 
if Hanson had known about Yetis or Sasquatch or anything else, you can bet your bottom dollar that would have been up there rather than caveman. Because that's a lot more spectacular than saying I've got a caveman laying in the ice. Yetis and Sasquatch were something that were very much in the forefront of people's minds. So did he give a specific reason for denying the X-ray? I, I don't recall what it was. It just didn't happen. And he had whatever excuse it was at that point in time. He was vacillating on it for a while, and I was to the point of making the phone call because I had Dr. Norris Knight, who was uh, a dentist friend of mine, not the one who came and looked at it, but a different one. He's the fellow, by the way, who invented the Panaray. I don't know if any of you had that done. He's, he was one of the co-inventors of the Panaray. Uh, I think I asked you this last night, but does this thing still have impact on your life? I mean, your observations? Um, I, I have to answer you probably the same way I answered you last night. The major impact it had on my life was getting me ticked off enough at enough people to eventually want to say something about it because of the distortions. For instance, in Napier's book, saying that I was in some way a confederate for Hansen, which was pure and utter rubbish. Most of what's in his book and most of what's in everybody else's book is based on a bunch of fragments that people either decided were true or decided to make up. The only person who gave that thing even close to a fair shake was Odette Charnin. And she didn't have a whole lot of information, but at least she got my name fairly close. I don't know how in the world she ever got it. I was Perry Cullen in her book. Sir, is there any, anything to indicate at all that it might have been pieced together? Or I could find no sutures, and I, by sutures I don't mean stitching, I mean areas that are joining together, on anywhere on the body. And that's one of the things that puzzled me. I mean, the hair patterns just followed all the way down, and admittedly they didn't follow anything that I knew of or was able to identify from a book, but they were consistent. The whole carcass was consistent. And again, that is not to tell you by using the word carcass, I'm not trying to infer that that was in fact a real animal. It may have been manufactured, but if it was manufactured, it was manufactured at least in part of animal material. Sir? You plan to publish your observations? I, I never had any intention of being here much less publishing it. I've got a book in the works and I've got some other things that have absolutely nothing to do with this field. I'm a, I'm a fish out of water here. I'm, I was going to say, if you were, you should check with some other archaeologists about George Agagino being acceptable. Well, that's fine, you know. <laughs> you have your opinion, other people have their opinion. I am not here to judge George, George Agagino because I don't know the man other than having talked to him over the phone a couple of times. All I'm relating to you is what was told to me by some of his peers at the time. Clearly, whether or not it had a sagittal crest. Yeah, I, I mentioned that I couldn't see any indication of a large sagittal crest. Was its head kind of tilted back? It was tilted back slightly. Not much. It was, you know, maybe eight degrees. If I had a guess. At this point. So, in effect, if the sagittal crest started here, you would have seen. I would have seen it. Sure, there was. Here. See, it's not like this was flat ice. It wasn't flat ice. It was real, real wavy. You know, some places thicker and some places thinner. So did I. Yeah, you know, talk to talk to a victim of it right there. A, I was just a foolish student. B, they're scared to death of their lives in those universities. If he had called a hundred of them, he would have gotten one to respond. But after what, I, I think I probably talked to seven, eight, finally, and I just, I was spending so much time doing that that I wasn't getting my schoolwork done. Yes, sir. Uh, I thought I'd read somewhere, maybe it was my that he actually found the person who made the fake that you saw. And that is another distortion. That was true? That was Napier. They, it's not a question of finding the guy. We know who made the model. The temporal sequence is way out of sync. He did not make that model in 1966 or 67. That model was made in 1968 or 69. Probably in 1969. And he was not a Disney person. He did work out of California. He was not a Disney person. He freely admitted that Hanson paid him a great deal of money to make the thing. Also said that he never wanted any more dealings with Hanson. The damage to be had based on your present knowledge of the 
I'm not a forensic biologist. I couldn't answer that for the life of me. I'd be lying to you if I did. That's a lunch. I don't know. If you had a better feel for Hansen's personality, you perhaps run through the eight or ten or twelve different versions he gave you of where it came from. I'm afraid to do that because I'm afraid somewhere in print this is going to creep up. I really am. It's just a lot of people really wonder what he was like and why didn't this happen or why did you commit some I'd rather I'd rather answer specific questions than to go into all those stories because those stories are totally meaningless in this specific scope questions. of events. How many versions did he give you? At least ten. What was the first version? What was the what? The first version. The first version was that it was uh, found off of the coast of Siberia, frozen in a block of ice by some Russian uh, sealers or whalers. He changed that twice in the first conversation I had with him. What was the second? Uh, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> These things really have no credence. I'll give you one more version. He told me that he found it in Hong Kong had it smuggled back over into the United States at the behest of this mysterious owner that he worked for. When he found it in Hong Kong, it was already in the ice. Was there not also a story that it was shot uh, in Wisconsin or uh, Minnesota? Yeah, that was another story. <laughs> Several times. <laughs> See, but that didn't come from Hanson. That one was made up by someone else, notably, I think, Mr. Hubelman's, but again, I don't want to do the same thing to him that he did to me. What story is that? Okay, so I don't know. All I know is that one did, that is one of the few that did not come from Hanson. Okay? Sir? Presuming that it, it is animal tissue uh, in the condition that you saw, how would, what would you say its condition is today if kept in those Jello. <laughs> <laughs> what would happen to the bone tissue? Oh, it's, it should still be there. I mean, unless something was real acidic and granted decomposition in a confined area like that does become seriously acidic, but not enough to destroy the bones, I don't think. So I think Dr. Grant is the person to ask about that rather than me. In some of the writings, I remember something about fluids coming out of the container or... Odor, not fluids. That was another one that I read also about fluids leaking. I don't know if fluids were leaking. There were blood traces in the ice that had oozed, and those were visible in a number of areas where the arm was broken, left orbit, and behind the skull. Yeah? Another one. Do you remember limb portions, arms to legs, and where the outer Yeah, uh, they were slightly longer than a human should have been. I have proportionately long arms and legs. So I'm talking about the arms. We'll, I'll go to the legs in a moment. Uh, and they were, his were proportionately longer than mine were. I was doing this a lot next to the little case. The legs were relatively short, well muscled. Uh, the nails were broken, had a lot of dirt and other materials around them. Uh, there was a lot of chipping on the nails, but they were very spade-like in appearance. What color were they? Uh, translucent, from what I could tell. Translucent, yeah, but that's not a color. Well, <laughs> you asked me what color they were. What color are blue eyes? No, translucent is a description of... But there, there's no such thing as a blue iris. Are you aware of that? I really People with blue eyes have a translucency as opposed to a transparency, and all you're seeing is optic purple reflected backward. Okay. The, the nails didn't have a color. The only color I could see is what was underneath it, which was a brown. The nails were translucent, yellowed up, but they were okay, translucent. So the, underneath, the skin color was brown, and underneath the nail was brown. Mm -hmm. Anything else? Yes, sir. What appeared to be spacious material being squeezed out of some of the pores. I say appeared to be. Okay. Again, had I had my eventual education at that point in time, I might have been better qualified to make a comment on that. Mr. Francis? Yeah, I remember seeing that thing. Uh, I was about four years old. It was 19, I think, 67. At that Parmatown was its first Mall, trip. At the Parmatown Mall. And I remember vaguely that this, the dis display around the case <clears throat> said that it was found around the, in the Siberian Ocean floating in a block of ice. Uh, 
retrieved by fishermen or something. What when you saw the display, did did what did the description of how it was found, was it the same thing? Exactly the same. You saw it in its first incarnation. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Did you ever have the opportunity to talk to the model maker about some of the details that you have mentioned, uh, you personally, or see any account? A good, a good friend of mine spoke to the man. He was not terribly forthright and forthcoming about the whole thing, but uh, it was a situation where he felt Hansen was a complete crook. He had done some work for him, gotten paid for it, and that's all he cared about. And on the record, did he mention the date that he had produced this model? As I say, it was either 68 or it was either late 68 or early 69. It was subsequent to uh, Sanderson and Gilman's. Let's see what record. On time. we get up to go do something, things fall all to hell. And I mean, things went to hell. You may have seen Both my vehicles were down. I got a wife and two kids, and I can't want to leave her with that. So I have to fix my car, let alone my van, is all over my garage at this very moment. And the guy, the guy that works for me, well, I fixed it. I mean, it'll run for a long time. The guy that works for me quits on me two weeks before, so I'm training another guy while I'm not getting the damn thing down. I have bills coming out of my hand. I shouldn't even be here, really. I should be home. Let's stop it. this rare and unique content, please show your support by subscribing and leaving comments.